Hi, I'm Christy Ballantyne. I'm a preventive cardiologist at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and delighted to be with Aaron Mikos today, who is also a preventive cardiologist and one of the, the, the leaders in uh, women's cardiology, but also in the entire area of prevention. And in particular, Aaron, you've always taken a comprehensive look at prevention. And your topic at this meeting about you know, obesity, inflammation, and cardiometabolic risk, uh, can you give us a little bit more, some of the highlights of, uh, of your presentation? Right. Well, as you know, obesity is a serious um, but treatable chronic disease, but unfortunately it doesn't get the same level of attention as other chronic diseases. And there can be a lot of bias um, towards persons with overweight and obesity by society and also by other healthcare professionals. But we know that obesity is complex. There are um, neural and genetic and environmental and hormonal factors. So it's far more than calories in versus calories out. It's a lot more about chemistry than character. You know, the, the brain plays a central role in what we take in and how much we store. And uh, obesity, you know, has about 60 to 80 percent, you know, genetics determination. Um, and so even um, although lifestyle changes, which we're both all very enthusiastic about lifestyle, um, although that can be successful in initially achieving uh, weight loss for many, we know that unfortunately the majority, 80%, will regain uh, weight, the weight back and within five years. And so we do need additional solutions to address um, the treatment of obesity, this chronic disease. And I've been trying to get more cardiologists on board because obesity is linked to so many cardiovascular complications, heart failure, particularly heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, as well as lots of other health outcomes like sleep apnea and cancer. And so we need all hands on deck to address this disease of obesity, including the engagement of other other cardiology specialists. So, you know, I've had a long-standing interest in inflammation going back to, you know, my days as a postdoc doing basic research. But one thing that's been fascinating, when you think of adipose tissue, it's just, you know, it's just there to store fat. But in fact, there's a lot of interesting biology that's come out about adipose tissue, and especially in regards to inflammation. That, it, that you know, it's not just storing fat, that this obesity is impacting inflammation. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is why we're highlighting this at our cardiometabolic health spring meeting, which is all focused on inflammation. So as you said, adipose tissue is not just a passive reservoir of fat. It's, it's metabolically active. It secretes hormones, adipokines, and can release inflammatory markers like IL-6. We think that uh, there's, um, you know, that uh, things like GLP-1 um, uh, receptor uh, agonists uh, actually play, can play a role in activating the innate immunity, and there's immune cells that have GLP-1 receptors. Um, we know that weight loss can reduce uh, inflammatory markers, so uh, weight loss by any number of means can lower things like CRP levels. Uh, and so I think this is why um, you know, inflammation may be one of those mediating factors that link obesity to chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease. You know, it's interesting, we talked about lifestyle. And so we are both huge proponents of lifestyle, diet and exercise. But I can remember, I'm a little older, that, you know, people were saying, well, you know, in regards to lipids, this is because people are not eating well. And, you know, why, would we, why should we use medications for that? I mean, if it's really a lifestyle problem. And, uh, but it's the same thing, if, you know, if a smoker gets lung cancer, we don't say that's a lifestyle problem. Uh, and even with hypertension, people sometimes would say, well, diet and exercise, I can, do, get, I can get by with that. And, and, it, and it does help but it doesn't stop us from sometimes using pharmacotherapies. Now, the world of obesity is really changed in the last five to 10 years. And I mean, can you just give us some updates? Because, you know, it was, I think, part of the reasons that people had that attitude towards lipids and cholesterol was, you know, our medicines were pretty bad. We didn't really have anything good and then statins came out. Uh, and, and it's the same thing for blood pressure. You know, when you were dealing with things like clonidine and aldamed, uh, which had lots of side effects and weren't that effective, but now we've got great medications. So I think we're, we're kind of in a new era, don't you think, Erin? I mean, talk a bit about you know where, what's happening in the field and where it's going. Right. 
So, you know, we still have bariatric surgery, which uh, can uh, confer about 25% to 30% uh, weight reduction. So that's still an option, but, you know, it's invasive and uh, can be associated with complications and it's not for everybody. The um, older anti-obesity medications can confer about five to 10% weight loss. Um, but they can have significant side effects and um, you know, have not been demonstrated to be cardiovascular beneficial and uh, may potentially, like fenteramine, potentially have some cardiovascular concerns. But now we're in a new era with the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists and other incretin-based therapies. Um, so semaglutide uh, in the STEP trial uh, reduced um, uh, weight by a weight change by 12 percent, uh, which conferred about you know 30 pounds of uh, weight loss um, compared to placebo. And then you have um, trisepatide, the dual agonist, um, conferred about you know 20 percent um, weight reduction. Uh, again, we're getting closer to the range now of what we see with bariatric surgery. And in those trials, you know almost. 90% of those treated with the GLP-1 therapy achieved at least 5% or more of weight loss. And we think that that's sort of the threshold of clinically meaningful weight loss if we can get at least 5% weight loss. Furthermore, you know that in persons with type 2 diabetes, the GLP-1 receptor agonists have shown to have cardiovascular benefit. They can reduce major adverse cardiovascular events by 15%. And so I've been using these therapies since the LEADER trial came out in 2016 um, in persons with diabetes because these are cardiovascular prevention agents and the benefit seems to be beyond the A1C lowering. Um, and so it was easy for me as a cardiologist to sort of move into this weight management and using these agents because I already knew how to counsel patients about how to start them and start with the lowest dose and titrate up slowly to avoid the GI side effects. Now we don't yet know whether uh, these agents can reduce cardiovascular events in persons who are overweight and obese who don't have diabetes. Um, the SELECT trial uh, was investigating that in persons at high cardiovascular risk with overweight and obesity um, but without diabetes, um, evaluating semaglutide. And I believe those results are going to be presented at the American Heart Association meeting later this fall. But I think that if that also shows a reduction in cardiovascular events, then it's really time for cardiologists and, and other uh, broader um, clinicians to get involved in the management of obesity for cardiovascular and other health prevention. Yeah, so I think this is an area, you know, we talk about sometimes, we know statins are great drugs, you know, it, and we need to be more aggressive on lipids, but in terms of the residual risk, it's not all going to be in one area. It's not going to be all lipids. If you've treated blood pressure down to 120 over 80, they may still have a high residual risk. And one of the things that we do measure is high C CRPs. And if CRP is high and someone is obese, you know, I mean, it, it, it turns out that we saw we did in the look ahead trial that the, which was not as effective as these new agents, but the reduction in CRP was as much if not greater than you get with a high intensity statin uh, for it. So it, it, it does make me think that maybe some of this residual risk, we have to see what the studies show, mm -hmm. but it is an option I think that in terms of when people are loaded with risk and we've you know gone the traditional things, we hit blood pressure, we hit lipids, but obesity now, if they've been unable to do it with lifestyle, you know, we've got some therapies that, you know, you can pretty routinely be getting over 10% weight loss, which was, that was not possible a decade ago. Right. So these agents are indicated in persons with BMI above 30 or, or BMI above 27 who have at least one weight-related comorbidity. And again, this is after individuals have tried at least six months or more of a dedicated um, lifestyle uh, weight loss intervention program. But as I mentioned, there's so many factors that there's a strong um, you know, set point in the brain that uh, unfortunately for many patients, weight um, lifestyle changes may be insufficient alone to get desired weight. And so now we have therapy that can help. This is a treatment for obesity. Uh, it is not a cure. Um, we do know when you stop these agents that people can regain weight, just like if you had hypertension and you stopped your hypertension medicines, your um, blood pressure will go up. And the same thing as if you were to stop your statin, you know, your LDL would go up. Um, so, but it's uh, a part of a comprehensive program that includes lifestyle changes. 
And you know, it'll be interesting to see in the future um, whether there could be some other alternate way, you know, an induction phase and then a maintenance phase. Um, but right now, they're sort of intended to be um, long-term treatments. You know, I'm, one of the things, just to reemphasize, you know, it's like when we, when we put someone on a statin, it doesn't mean you can eat whatever you want. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're doing the lifestyle and we're adding something else. And so in the, in the area here, particularly with obesity, what can happen sometimes, I think, when people get a little nausea and maybe their meals are smaller because of they realize that with the agents they're taking, small meals do better than large meals. There's a little bit of behavioral modification that you might lose when the medicines are stopped. Really important to think of this as a whole comprehensive process. Uh, and as you mentioned, diet and exercise are part of it. And particularly, what we know is that weight maintenance, exercise gets to be very important in weight maintenance uh, uh, with it. It's, it's something that you know, I know you practice it, it's what you preach, I do too, but it, it is something that uh, what we're just seeing is these pharmacotherapies, it's, a, it's incredible, but not to, not to lose sight of the fact that we also want to not only, you know, tell people about diet and exercise, but it's really important as a healthcare provider that you set an example uh, as much as you can in your own life. Yeah, well, I... Um you know, I, I agree completely uh, with this, and it's been in my clinic experience and my patients that many times that when they um, are able to lose um, significant weight with these new agents, they are feeling better and they're actually able to re-engage more back into exercise and lifestyle changes because um, they're you know feeling better and at a, at a lighter weight. And so this is all you know in combination together. Correct. And so, and, and general rule is, so I do think it's important. Uh, in terms of kind of coaching, success is motivating to people in general. And so when you, when they see that you're, and it's always joint decision making. So when, when you come up with a plan and when the plan is working, it tends to get them more engaged uh, in the process and maybe more accepting of even some more lifestyle changes if, if you can work with people to do that. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a really exciting area. Uh, there's so much that's going on, and that's one of the great things about attending these meetings is you get an update in so many different areas. Uh, it's not just lipids or blood pressure, it's obesity, diabetes, lifestyle, and it's a great chance to get to talk to colleagues, and then the meetings are small enough that you can come up and ask questions and uh, get to catch up with people uh, also just in terms of you know making connections. So, Aaron, thanks so much. Yeah, looking forward to it.